accident due to weather. So on the two locations of people who Oh, the uh, the issue of uh, relocating the people is an aggressive campaign of uh, sensitization in the communities. Actually, the DWS project in Sao Tome has a communication officer. Uh, since she was recruited, I think she spent about half a day a week in the office. Most of the time she's in the field, in the communities, talking to them, creating committee to back her up, to give her right information, and presenting the movies and uh, everything that she did it for six good months. And that has made them to move on. She, she, she accepted from, uh, from the time she was recruited to be uh, a field officer, not office officer. <laughs> then uh, that has helped a lot. And uh, I still remember um, talking to her a few days ago. She was saying that uh, that has revolutionized her uh, journalism. Uh, qualification because now she's doing communication for development and I think it's a uh, it's possible to try uh, that communicating and being in the field all the time with the population that will make them they need facts and if you present them the facts they will be able to change uh, their behavior because there are a lot of beliefs in uh, those rural communities where they say that our ancestors were here, we will not be <coughs> out of here. Uh, but you need really uh, time to spend with them, to demonstrate to them that they need to move on. Uh, the, the second question about uh, uh, fishermen uh, getting lost in the sea, it's because of weather issues. Um, many families uh, lost their relatives because of that. And the project came and uh, gave them tools uh, to help them. Every time they need to go to, to do fishing, they have to take uh, the equipment with them, and as well they have information. Actually, we have the SMS frontline system in place, which is giving them information on time. They have mobile phones, uh, they receive mobile phones that they, they are able to see that a, a picture, a color in, in their mobile phone, if it's red, don't go fishing. If it's green, you can go. If it's orange, <coughs> wait a bit. Listen to the radio. That the community radio are working as well together with the Meteorology Institute to, give, to inform them. That has reduced tremendously the amount of uh, loss in the sea. The last case we had is um, a case of six, uh, six young fishermen. Uh, they left all the equipment at home that day and they went fishing, and they found themselves in uh, Guinea-Bissau uh, after almost 15 days. Uh, and then when we found out, uh, we realized that they wanted to, uh, to go and leave there. But most of the time, it's now possible. We've uh, actually, the, the World Bank project has acquired a, a marine station which is able to track down um, any loss on the sea. And uh, actually, the, the number of people uh, getting lost in the sea has reduced. Thank you very much. It's also implementing uh, another LDCF project, Adaptation Coastal uh, Management. And we are piloting this in the second largest city in Liberia, or coastal city. Definitely, it's very, very difficult to move coastal communities from near the sea because you will understand that all of their livelihood are tied to the sea. So normally, they want to be around the sea. But this project, uh, we are building what the engineers calling uh, breakwaters and, uh, and revetments using rocks, I mean, three dimension of rock. We have the 2.5 centimeter rocks, I mean, and the core stone from 11 centimeter upward, and then big boulders from 100 centimeters long. So the community had to move before we start the real project, and to move them was not 
merely an easy thing. They wanted compensation, and in the project document, there was no um, allocation, budgetary allocation to compensate people to move. So we had to rely on the local <coughs> authorities to move the people. We raised so, so much awareness, spoke to people, but they could not move. They could not move. And I can tell you, uh, it had to be by there is some force, but from the government, not UNDP. Because the local authorities saw the threat to the city. This city was going already. I mean, a very major area of the city was already going, and the, um, the entire city was on a threat. So the local authority uh, went in after so much intervention, negotiation, they could not move. And one day they just went there with bulldozer and <laughs> started. I mean, when they started with the first place, but of course, they made an allocation. They prepared a place where these people were supposed to move. They, they, they prepared a place, everything, and they were supposed to move there. So they had to do some force. And when they saw the first house coming down, and then people started moving to go to that place. But it's not an easy thing to move people from around, you know, the sea where they have been. They have always said that they want to be near the sea. But with the intervention of the project, I mean, I can tell you, <coughs> the impact has been so great, the land uh, has been reclaimed, some of them are coming back again. Thank you. Based on what Moses said, in the context of South Tome, uh, we didn't have brought down houses. <laughs> what, it, we, what we told them, we negotiated with them. We said, look, you will keep your houses by the sea, but you will transform them as a place to keep your fish. And you will go and live on the other side. You know, what you will do, keep those houses till the day the sea will come and take them out, and <coughs> keep your material, your fishing material and your, uh, your product inside. And that was one of the main reasons that made them to accept to remove to move from where they were to go to the new site. <laughs> Thank you. Sounds very different from when us NGOs were complaining against the World Bank, relocating people to build big dams. Very different thing. All right. So. Um, uh, Thank you so much. All these presentations were so interesting, and there were all the different realities, and so much progress, so much commitment. So first of all, I would like to ask my fellow panelists here to, to give me some, uh, some feedback. And you know, first we'll comment, and then we'll kind of discuss as a panel uh, how we want to draw conclusions, how we want to think about the future, and, um, and take <coughs> stock of what has been done so far. You want to start, John? Sure. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, like Bonnie, I was very impressed. Uh, uh, many of you clearly put uh, significant effort into uh, putting this together. Uh, however, uh, uh, I think there were some lessons to be learned for us and also for you from the collected set of 11 presentations. And I'm very glad that the way things worked out that the last group we heard from, Seo Tome and the Principe, I guess that's the correct pronunciation, uh, because I think it illustrated uh, very well what we were trying to get at. Uh, when I looked across the, uh, all the presentations, the impression I had was it was way too much top down. Uh, this program is focused on providing information both about changing climate, about warning of w severe weather events within that changing climate context to users, which can be uh, not only commercial activity, government agencies, but perhaps most importantly, people. Uh, farmers, small businessmen, uh, small businesswomen, uh, who are directly impacted, and we have we did see a few examples of that uh, scattered through the presentations, but it came across that it's really the government figuring out what it needs to do for itself. 
not what it came, it did not come across as the government figuring out what the people needed by going to the people, going to the field, and spending time. So it came across as a top-down type approach. And my concern, because I'm really a tech guy, is those needs that are determined at the bottom need to drive the technology. The, and the, the classic example is, where are we going to deploy our equipment? It's not for the convenience of the Met Service or the Department of Agriculture. It's really driven by where do we most need to deploy our scarce resources to have the largest impact on the largest number of people. Uh, some of your countries have flooding issues. That, to me, should be a focus area. Some of your countries have severe agricultural issues uh, where you want insurance for the farmers. Are we actually considering where the banks are willing to invest in insurance and where they're not willing to invest in insurance because there's not met information from those areas? I know that's the case in two of your countries because I've talked to bankers in those countries. So I, I think when you go home and you think about where you're going with your plans, think about the bottom, not just at the top of which ministry is going to do what, but who's actually gone out and talked to the people, done the surveys, and figured out that, yeah, we really need to put a weather station over in this town because it really is going to mean the following things to the group of people that live in that area. And then everything sort of flows uphill from, from that bottom piece. Uh, another thing that I've uh, heard uh, from a number of you, all of your countries have borders. In some cases, they're natural borders and you live along an ocean or a river. In other cases, they're lines that were drawn on a map 100 years ago. Uh, the weather, the climate, could care less about geopolitical boundaries. And a number of the problems that you face trying to solve here, a pretty good one uh, about flooding upstream, ultimately coming downstream. I think we need to put more emphasis on talking to one another. Uh, I think it's very easy to get too high level with state departments and ministries of foreign affairs and stuff, whereas the meteorological community has a long history of coordinating, collaborating, communicating among ourselves to get the job done. And in some cases, I think there are existent treaties of how to do this, but in others, it may just take a bottom, again, a kind of a bottoms up approach to make it happen. Because you cannot solve all your problems by yourself. The meteorological problems extend across these boundaries. And if we're particularly going to get into the early warning business at the level we need to, we've got to coordinate with the people upstream, whether it's upstream by river or upstream by airflow. And my third point, uh, again, kind of a plus and minus. I was very pleased to hear many of you talking about what you got to do to sustain your program. That's a plus. I think a lot of you underestimate how difficult this is going to be. And I was pleased to hear that some of you are, are, have got the idea of having a business plan. And a, a well-written business plan it does not guarantee success, but I, I Every time I've seen an organization that did not have a good business plan, it did guarantee failure. So, so uh, Alan here is, is much more attuned to this sort of thing than I am. But uh, I really think that a, a, a good business plan for each of your organizations, whether or not your government really allows you to recover costs, just having a business plan itself tells you what your costs are and where your money is going. Uh, from a different perspective is, is really important. It'd be very, it needs to be realistic, too. Uh, let's see, what else did I have here? I think that's enough for now. Thank you, John. Um, I really would like, I, I think it's good if we ask the panelists to speak first, because I would like to have a rich conversation. Um, don't, don't consider this just, you know, dumping ideas. I would really like you to to react to that, to discuss, and I really hope you disagree so we can have a real serious conversation, you know, not saying thank you very much for your, let's just, let's just, you know, put our ideas and, and fight for what we believe in. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks to everyone for um, the work that you guys did in your presentations. It was really helpful and insightful to see 
some of the challenges and opportunities and how some people have creatively solved some of these problems. Um, good ideas for other countries to, to follow on with. Um, some of the things that I picked up was, um, coming from the technical background, was the issues about, um, a lot of it came out as just procurement of equipment and putting it down and not much emphasis on down the value chain of where this information goes. And some of that information that came out was, um, there are good collaborations with the disaster management structures, water resource management. So yes, it is happening. And as the weather services, I know that you guys are going to have serious difficulty in influencing how that information gets used or if that information gets used. The critical thing is making sure that your data is credible and the information that you pass on, they're able to make a decision on. Uh, from my experience, what, what would happen is Take, going back to that top-down approach is uh, a national disaster management center came to us while we were at the weather service and said we need this, um, we need a facility to, to issue warnings to uh, a community and the community is three and a half million people. And the weather service says, okay, we'll, we'll put a rain gauge for you uh, in, a, in a space of probably the size of South Domain, they'll put one rain gauge. Uh, and that's, that was insufficient. We didn't listen to the user requirement. Um, and we put in a poor solution that didn't, didn't work. And ultimately, what ended up happening was um, only after three years and multiple disasters and billions of rands of damage, um, was pressure came from the end user, from the community, that then drove the weather service to eventually act and providing a, a decent, innovative type of solution. Um, so there, there needs to be some sort of... Um, uh, coordination, a better coordination. Uh, a lot of countries mentioned the issues of evaluating the protocols and the procedures of the emergency management to see whether or not that works. And these are some of the things that, not just putting in the technology, we've got to look at how do you use it? Um, how do you uh, make sure it's working? How do you verify and validate? And then, if necessary, go back iteratively and continue to improve it. Um, I think it's also one of the premises of the ICAO and WMO as well. It's continuous improvement, right? So it's not just about providing data that goes into some database. It's making sure that whatever you're doing is contributing to something and making sure you're continuously improving. Um, so that, that was the core of what I picked out, um, not just from a technology point of view, but also a lot of you have highlighted the issues of skills development and retention of staff, and that's a big one. I think the moment you, you train people um, and, and upskill them, then you, you enable them and create self-value. But it's how do you then, um, how do you then um, keep them, right? It, it's a difficult one. And each country is at varying levels of advancement within your own med services. And, and that's for, for reasons of civil war and Ebola. And we appreciate that, but you've all come a long way. Um, and I think what we're going to try and do in this, the next implementation phase is use the LTA because we've designed the LTAs for different levels of advancement and uh, innovative advancement. And we'd want that kind of discussion to come out as well. And we want people to be open. When we talk about automation and, and generation of warnings and forecasts, it's not that we're trying to take away from the impact that the med service is trying to make or the, the function. It's just making sure that we capacitate you, um, what do you call it, sequentially, or you know, we don't dump all the information in one place. You've got to make sure that, that that goes to the end user correctly, and we, we're trying to prepare for that. Um, I think that's it. Uh, some of my points will come back to me a bit later on. Okay. But, but those are my main issues. Thank you. These were extremely rich presentations. Um, I, I think it was in Dar es Salaam when we were asking some of you, how much do you interact? And we were told hardly at all among the project managers. And the idea for this meeting was born. So it's very exciting to see it happening and to see, as my colleagues have said, such rich detail and to see so much progress having been made in the past year. Um, my first comment is on reflection. Um, Bonnie, I would like to change my title from private sector to sustainability. <laughs> because the objective is not private sector. The objective is to promote sustainability. 
And we've had different reflections on that, and a number of your presentations have pointed to it. But why private sector? Because of the ability to promote sustainability and to serve the people. It's not to promote the private sector. I did that for a while too, but this is about sustainability. And a, a couple of you pointed to the specific output in the project documents, 2.5, that identified this very specifically as why we're talking about the private sector. But even though I'm mainly coming at this from a business perspective, I did have, as a non-technical person, unlike my colleagues, what admittedly may be a very simple-minded question in response to some of your presentation. Several of them, I didn't keep track of how many, include rehabilitation of existing stations. My simple question is, if they failed before, what has changed or will be done differently? Why should we expect now, after rehabilitation, they will continue to operate? And I frankly didn't really hear the answer to that question. And I can tell you from traveling with my colleagues now to several of your countries that perhaps the most contentious issue repeatedly has been the discussion about placement on cell phone towers. And I want to reiterate, we are not advocates for cell phone towers. Again, that is being discussed because we've seen it as a practical, feasible solution for the absence of sustainability because it addresses the need for security and power and communication. If you have other solutions, that's great. But when I just hear, we're going to rehabilitate, please, just help me understand what's going to be different why will they continue to operate this time? I think we do have a responsibility shared with you to be able to answer that question. Second, I think that there is a significant synergy that isn't always obvious between innovative technology and the potential for business applications. So again, we're not, many of you are now fully into innovative technology, so I don't have to make that case. But I do think the relationship between the technology and the business opportunities has not been clearly stated enough. The low costs are what allow cost recovery and reasonable competitive fees. If you're putting in forty or fifty thousand dollar systems, the cost structure just becomes so high that the opportunity for significant cost recovery declines proportionately. If the system cost drops to 5000 or perhaps even less, then a very different set of opportunities arise. Similarly, we've talked about the difference between providing localized, automated, and timely weather information versus systems which are placed primarily for synoptic observation purposes. And I know we've had some interesting and repeated conversations about the importance and value of the WMO. I'll leave that to my colleagues if it is appropriate to discuss again. My point would simply be, if you're going to serve business needs, that has to drive, as John said, for local and community needs, the type of information that you generate and the location of the systems. You have to be generating sufficiently local and timely, which, off, which basically means it better be fast to be relevant for business needs. That drives a lot of the discussion about the type of technologies that should be put in place. Similarly, while we've talked about the cell phone companies in different contexts, of course they're essential for communicating the data. But in most respects, that's trivial. When we've met, as we did in Uganda recently, with all the cell phone companies, and we described what the data communication needs are, it's trivial as a business requirement, technically, for them. What's much more significant is the larger potential for sharing revenue from business applications. And that gets into a very different conversation about the type of technologies and business partnerships and the sequence that we're going to go through. And I think that will come out somewhat further in the discussion of the LTA, 
and the type of value-added services that were incorporated in the LTA. Third, we didn't have a lot of discussion about partnerships and PPPs. That's kind of been my thing. I talked about it in the previous workshops. But I think that perhaps, rather than get into this kind of jargon phrase, PPP, maybe I should put more emphasis on a single word, which is partnership. Because the very word connotes some very important differences in how these things are normally being done. Because it's one thing to inform, in other words, to go to tell somebody something. It's something different to go forward and say, I want to work with you. I want to make you aware of what we are doing in order to understand how it relates to your business and what you see we could be doing differently. That's a very different conversation. And I wasn't quite clear, even though many of you did talk about some of your initial conversations with cell phone companies and even some businesses. And I was very pleased to see that in the market study through Anthony, we'll go into that in much more detail. I really was hoping to hear a little more about this word partnership. I also think, as has been said, that working together with business is going to require some different skills and technical support. This has come up. We've been told the CERTA team may need to help in this respect, and we're prepared to do that. I've mentioned that I brought the IFC uh, colleague from Nairobi into the meeting in Kampala because he's the public-private partnership advisor working out of Nairobi, Michael Opaji. So I do think that there are other resources and types of support that we can provide. But as John said a few minutes ago, having a business plan will lead to what type of staffing do we need, what type of support might we need. And without the business plan, it's going to be very difficult to get there. I also wanted to uh, remark briefly, if, I, if I'm not abusing my time, Bonnie, to, <laughs> to um, also make an interesting observation about some of the businesses who we've met with in our country visits. And I, what I was really pleased to hear, especially from some of the larger and international companies, is that they were very open to a conversation about social responsibility. And I did hear several of you refer to this as a relevant and acceptable conversation. On the other hand, I've also been told by some of you that the first question from some companies is, sure, we'll help you. How much are you willing to pay? And I realize that that distinction is going to occur. But I. I was really impressed the number of times companies, and I must say in a few instances they were clearly foreign companies who perhaps are more concerned about their public image, because they are foreign companies, uh, about doing something because it's good for the country and it's good for the company's image over the long term. And I, I think that that element is a perfectly appropriate one for you to be bringing up in your conversations. Let's talk about your responsibility as a major business in my country. And we, we, we never brought it up, I think, George M. But we were actually having companies say that to us, that they were really pleased to hear about this and that they were willing to engage because they <coughs> perceived it as something of significant potential public good. Um, Finally, let me just close with a reference to some news that we saw and were sharing yesterday. Some of you may also have seen it over the internet. The UK Met Office just found out that it is losing its client, the BBC. This is an extraordinary announcement. The BBC is tendering an offer for weather support services it will use in all its global communication for competitive bidding with active participation from private weather services. And I think that there is a larger message here of some relevance, even though it is not immediately ne necessarily affecting you and the Met agencies in Africa. Global weather services are a multi-billion dollar business today. 
today. And it is a very high-tech industry that is finding more and more uses for low-cost sensors, data processing through the cloud, international communication to planes, ships, automobiles that will be self-driving in the future and be aware when there are weather hazards. This is a wonderful development. It will have enormous economic, health, and safety implications. But my closing comment would simply be, you have the opportunity through this project, not as perhaps the most immediate priority, but to really start thinking about this larger community of business services, technologies, and products, and how it can be put to use in your country. And I think in approaching the cell phone companies, we're seeing some of this parallel type of opportunity. We're seeing every imaginable kind of public service linked on the backbone of cellular communication that has leapfrogged what would otherwise have been billions of dollars and years of investment in landlines that are no longer necessary. And you know, in Liberia, as you're being forced, or Sierra Leone, to go through reconstruction, you can be, frankly, thinking about these things and incorporating them in your efforts. And there are the immediate needs in terms of extreme events and disasters that are happening today. But there is, just as in cellular communication, the opportunity to be looking ahead and thinking about how this is an opportunity and not just a burden and a responsibility. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, I, um, I think your, your list of, of comments and observations were so crystal clear, I don't even need to um, summarize them. So I'll, I'll just give you a little bit, very quickly, my impression of, of this um, very interesting couple of days. Uh, of course, like, like all of us, uh, I was really happy and really positively impressed by the progress. The, pro the progress and the commitment. These teams are all fully committed. It's, it's crystal clear. There are teams with the project manager, the country office, the Met offices. I mean, I can, it's, it's tangible how much the commitment is there, which is, which is the basis for every successful uh, enterprise. Uh, I'm also not worried, actually, even though, you know, between the lines, sometimes explicitly, sometimes between the lines, the two typical issues that are capacity building, lack of financing, retaining skills. I'm less worried about that because I know we can fundraise, we know we can get the money. Um, we know the capacity can be built. We've done it together over the years with UNDP, with the JEF, with the LDCF. We've done it in this, in, the, in LDCs, we've done it, we can do it. Um, However, when I saw, there were a few things that were, that were popping on, on, my, on my mind, and, and uh, a, a kind of an issue about the approach came, came to me. One was, uh, there, were, there were a few things, for example, from, uh, from Alfe in, uh, in, uh, in Tanzania, insufficient national coverage. Well, that's not just in Tanzania, that is everywhere. Insufficient national coverage. In our face, right? Inadequate obs observing network systems, in our face. Poor communication facilities, common to all. Um, and, and now I'm going to ask you something. I, I'm going to make a, um, uh, I, I really want to provoke a, a, a conversation, a dialogue, a discussion here. Uh, among all of you, I would like to talk specifically to the, to the Met Offices people and to those who have been aligned with that position. But my, my uh, concern is the following. I see this, this approach that uh, shows me a kind of a dichotomy. On the one hand, there is climate change. There are the vulnerable communities. There is the fund, there is the discussion that this conversation is going on because people are dying out there. People are dying because of climate impacts. In your countries, in all over the countries in the world, actually, climate change doesn't discriminate. Kills everywhere. But in LDCs in Africa, it's even harder because sometimes there is less capacity. The connection between understanding your risk 
and, and, uh, and acting uh, through adaptation actions that make you less vulnerable to climate change became a reality that asked for better, more reliable, and faster data. So my, my feeling is that on the one hand, there is the community of practitioners for adaptation, climate change experts, vulnerable communities, all together, the UNDP, all together claiming we have to fight climate change. We need the data to do it. On the other hand, I had the feeling that there is a cultural disconnect between the community who wants to work for climate change and the community specifically who holds this data, which is mostly, I see it in the, in the individuals who work in the Met offices, that is mostly the data are, are kind of disconnected from the rest of the world. The data have to be specific, have to be following the WMO standards, and we'll go probably to a computer in Geneva and everybody will study climate change. We're not here to study climate change. This, this project, there are other projects financed to study climate change because that's very important. But this, this project is aimed, this financing is aimed at saving lives, is at helping people. Um, when, when Alan was mentioning companies, businesses, fine, but people, let's look at people, survival issues. We're talking about survival issues and very basic development needs. Having access to food, having a house on your head, having access to water, these are the issues that we are dealing with when we ask for this data. So uh, what I'm asking the, 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 the Met Office's people, please tell me you disagree, and most of all, convince me that I'm wrong. Convince me that I'm wrong, because if, you if I get out of this room convinced that I was wrong, I'll be happier, because now I'm very concerned. So, Convince me that I'm wrong, that I, I misunderstood your approach, that actually is not true that you're so isolated from the reality that you actually are less concerned than, than the other rest of the international and global community about the poor people uh, who need the data for adaptation purposes. Because the solution is there. The WMO has come three times, has been putting it in speeches, in PowerPoints, I can actually re-send you a PowerPoint from WMO who made it in Tanzania, and over and over, they have established this network of networks that are not specifically uh, aimed at providing synoptic data that can come from different sources, and they are committed to actually harmonize this data. So not only, somebody said, how can you, how can you um, have data that come from different, uh, you know, different, for example, physical, location that doesn't meet all the, all the WMO standards. How can we compare these data? How can we harmonize them? Well, through this WIGOS initiative, they're actually asking to collect these data, and that will help you um, make them co compatible, even though they will not use. If you want to put a station on a, on, a, on a building, like the Philippine case, or in a cell tower, they will not use it for synoptic data, but they will use it for uh, adaptation purposes. They, they need that. There is this huge demand on data, and we need it for these adaptation purposes. So I, I believe that this dichotomy is not that ex extreme, but I had also the perception that there were some individuals within the, within the context of this project that weren't ready to, uh, to collect the data that helped serving the, the, the people and the development needs but we're more concerned about, uh, you know, pleasing some specific, narrowly defined definition of standards from WMO for specific purposes of, of you know, what it goes to the, the computers and, and is used for, for studying climate change. So if I'm wrong, please convince me. But that was my main concern. This project has all the potential to, to succeed. We can access people. We can save lives. We can, we can um, increase the national coverage. We can do so many things together. We have the money. We have the capacity. We have the commitment. But if someone drags his feet and said, I will not engage in this because I believe there are two or three uh, parameters don't fit my standards, then, then that worries me because it is as if we are pulling up the brake and not getting as far as we could. So I would like at this point to, to open up the discussion. And again, don't, don't give me too many thank you very much for your presentation. Tell me, you're wrong. I'm right. I want to you know, debate this. All right, thank you. Thank you. So uh, I have just two comments. The 
firstly, the general comments. Uh, um, I think the, your comments are very um, important and also very um, <laughs> eligible. I don't know how to say it. But then I think that in the PowerPoint template that has been sent it to us, I think it could have, could have been you know, better articulate uh, aspect that is very important for us to discuss here. Because if I look at the template, this was a, like a first 10 <laughs> uh, per section or you know, talking all about institution and also what's the contribution of each institution. And then we, you know, like you have said, I think we could have passed this part and then focused on a very important part like uh, what's the process that, you know, what is the approach that has been used in the country or what the kind of, you know, the implication of local community or the, what the kind of business plan that we have, I think that could have been better, you know, uh, illustrated in the presentation if it was well uh, insisted or highlighted in a template. So this is the general comments. And also the second one, just this is my opinion, but then, uh, you know, that today, uh, based on, you know, I'd say from our experience from Burkina Faso, you know, the country is going through the decentralization, decentralization process. So the implication of community is getting very important. So all the, you know, the thing that we have been doing in the EWS project, even from the initiation of the, this project, the, that has been done in a very participative process. So the, not only, I mean, that implementation, of course, is done in a high implication of local community. So uh, when we said just you did not see much of the top-down, uh, bottom-up approach in the many presentation, but then I guess we could have better argued in this if it was a very important point. <laughs> and then, you know, if I could give you the example, like even the placement of, uh, you know, weather station, that is, we cannot do it without <coughs> having discussion with the local authority and what they want. And, uh, and the, of course, the, uh, this is only the placement, but also the what kind of data, what kind of the needs at the lo local community level. Of course, it is done by the end user survey. So um, we did not mention it because, you know, we thought this was not one of the priority discussion for that presentation. So just sharing. <laughs> As one from the meteorological department, uh, not to differ with anyone, but to put in place the situation that I see the meteorological organizations find themselves. And I'll say it from an example. Uh, in the January, I think, somewhere between January and March, the World Bank came to Zambia uh, through an agency. And they were looking for radiation data uh, because Zambia is going through a situation where energy has become an issue because the rain season was poor. Uh, so we are looking at alternative energy. And uh, when they came to the Department of Meteorology, uh, we gave them what we have. We showed them our kind of equipment. And then we're told this is second class. And then uh, the uh, consultants, I decided to go ahead and buy equipment, which is called Festiglas. And then uh, here is a, a situation where you're talking of credibility, you are talking of reliability, and uh, the issue of accuracy, and talking and convincing the person that comes for the data that you have. And then you have to balance it between the cheap equipment and the quality demanded by the end user. So we end up in a situation where you have to have the balance. It's not about synoptic meteorology. I think, uh, let anyone tell me something about synoptic meteorology. I know that the synoptician can use 
uh, even a report from an individual that will say there is a storm in such a place and tell the clouds that are there. And then that will be put in his or her analysis as an input. Uh, but the demand from the end users put the meteorological institutions in a situation that they have to find a balance between the cheap and the accuracy demanded by some of the users that come to our offices and demand this data. That is the experience that I can share and have gone through. The, the, the World Bank is just one of such of experiences that we have faced as a country. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, the panelists. <clears throat> I start straight with the, uh, John Snow, um, just to complement uh, what Bukina Faso said. On the top-down uh, uh, format of the presentation, specifically uh, with regard to the technologies, I think at this point in time of the project, um, that is a bit acceptable, because we are at the uh, face of consulting on you know, the specifications and the requirements for the technology. And the, I think, um, apart from the aspect of the location of this equipment, um, we may not really get much involvement at the downstream level. So I just wanted to compliment on that. Um, I needed some clarification from Georgie concerning the application of the long-term agreement specifically with regard to, to capacity uh, building skills development. It wasn't very clear then. Um, to Alan, uh, the issue of rehabilitation of um, the weather stations and the value addition, um, I think looking at the aspect of historical data, we still need those base stations, and that's why in Uganda we put it as one of the outputs. Um, just because when it comes to forecasting long term, um, even bearing on the example of, of the weather index insurance, uh, which is one of the pilot projects being undertaken, the aspect of historical data was emphasized. So if you only focus on the new technologies that are being procured, there will be a gap. So I think there has to be a balance uh, between the traditional and the modern. Um, also, Alan, on the aspect of um, social responsibilities of companies willing to help, in the case of Uganda, when we organized the stakeholders workshop for UNMA, there were these sugar corporations coming quite handy. Actually, they requested UNMA to present their proposal for some kind of support. And I hope it's good the, uh, one of the directors of UNMA is here. That will be followed up. Um, I think Bonnie's comments they were quite insightful, and I recall when we came for the workshop, the conference in March, it was one of the orientation you gave us, that we always need to focus on the benefits of this project to saving life. So I'm just saying I'm a disciple of that. Thank you very much. And thank you. I would like also to, to share a uh, my, to provide my comment to Boni. Yeah, actually, in the recognition of the data division in Tanzania, and uh, under the support of this project, yeah, TMA organized a, a high level meeting. This was the meeting with the senior officials who are owning and operating weather station in Tanzania. The reason of this was just to, di to discuss and uh, to agree on how teamwork can benefit on getting the various data from the different institutions. In Tanzania, 
we have uh, different institutions who, uh, who are operating different, uh, I mean, nine other stations. Minister of Water has a lot of other stations. When they go to the Tanzania National Park, also they have got uh, nine other stations. So we, we support this meeting, and uh, the outcome of this meeting, that uh, all the institutions agree that they will provide data to TMA, and also from now, in the, uh, yeah, this was in May, they said that uh, every, new uh, every new stations will be constructed under the guidance of TMA and uh, following the WMO standard, so that the data can fit and they be used by the TMA. And also all the institutions, uh, they, they have meet to come up with the WIGOS strategy at the country level, and this, uh, we, are, we, are, we are showing that uh, we will start to increase more data and also to support the team to come up with the improving the more than the same as it does again. Uh, the issue that we have raised by Bonnie about, um, I think she ended up by challenging us that if we disagree with her, I think we cannot disagree with you when you are presenting facts as they are. Because at the end of the day, uh, we really have to serve the interests of the poor, vulnerable communities who need this data and need it in near real time. So that is the reality. So when you look at uh, the challenge of uh, climate change, it is really enormous and very, very massive. We need uh, to have uh, well-elaborated adaptation actions, which uh, rely on reliable and near real-time data to uh, help these communities, in fact, uh, adapt to this big monster of climate change. Then there is this issue of uh, data. Are we only relying on um, synoptic data? Are we, uh, like, is it cast in stone that we have to follow uh, the WMO uh, guidelines and standards to uh, get data that we really need? to provide this right of service, which is going to help the poor vulnerable communities in their adaptation action? Uh, the answer there would be yes and no. Uh, yes, in the sense that uh, this data is required, and it is required uh, in any uh, form, as long as it can help uh, the med services make a sound decision about uh, these uh, dangers and also provide a warning which can be very helpful. The most important thing that we can also realize is that uh, there is a reality that when you look at uh, the med services, especially the least people's country, uh, including most of the project countries for this particular state project, you will realize that uh, the infrastructure levels are really, really down. When we look at a project like this, we know that it's going to make a contribution. Pascal made it very elaborate. He even quoted numbers when he was making the Uganda presentation. He said that the reports indicate that at minimum, Uganda National Meteorological Services require at least a network of 240 stations. So that is the reality. The contribution of the project that we've stated could be between 20, I mean 10 and 20 percent. But I think in reality it could be between 10 and 12 percent. So when the med services look at an initiative like this with an aim of strengthening the med services right from the infrastructure development, we need to look at it as that. And in most cases, you'll find that when um, arguments and counter arguments come about the nature of the infrastructure, how do we install these stations and so on, sometimes they are very academic. Because the real underlying issue is that Metrological services is looking at this as part of building into this capacity. We want to maximize, if it is 20%, in most cases, what drives our decision is to look at all these stations uh, installed to be part and parcel of the required standard. I mean, of the required uh, uh, infrastructure requ uh, uh, network. Then there's also the issue of forecasting. We know very well that forecasting depends on the past, the present, and then you predict the future. So in most cases, you find that when we are trying to bring and acquire new infrastructure, we try to, I mean, we endeavor 
to link it to what we already have as our data, because it's going to build our capacity to uh, link the present with the past in order for us to predict the future. So in most cases, we find that what drives the best services is mainly one to, I mean, to add to what we already have, because the situation uh, is really, really bad. But the fact that you are talking about, when you look at these standards, when you look at the, uh, the alternative of sustainability of these projects by linking them to these uh, uh, telecom service providers, the must and so on, I think it is really, really important. And if it is going to give us the sustainability, we will so much welcome that. But the issue is, is that the infrastructure situation is so bad and we want to use the adv take advantage of this project to build on what we have for the future. Even when you look at Philippines, uh, I think the case was very, very uh, well elaborated. They said that at least the National Service has 150 stations which are well, uh, uh, I mean, which are covering almost the entire country. So that means that they have the foundation of doing their focus. So anything which comes uh, later really can be tinkered into the innovation, the technology, try and try something new and see whether it can go. But the biggest problem with the med services, sometimes they don't mention this uh, in the least developed countries, is the infrastructure situation is really, really bad. We first have to build our capacity, reach the acceptable level, then we can move into innovating and trying technologies and see uh, what we can get uh, from that. I think that is really my, uh, my input on that. Then there are also <coughs> some other issues that I also wanted just to raise. I think the first will go to Alan. Alan, in fact, uh, when you talk about the partnerships, um, that, uh, yesterday, I think, during lunch, we just commented about the insurance. And the, when you look at the weather index insurance, it has really come up very well through the country presentation. But then we also talked about uh, uh, what the African risk capacity is doing, mainly looking at insurance at a almost country level but using uh, the satellite data. I know there are demands, especially from Western Africa, where they want the project to also help uh, build capacity in terms of acquisition of this satellite data and so on. So I don't know what your comment uh, will be uh, in that particular case. Then finally, uh, uh, Pascal also talked about the corporate responsibility. I think that is great because really some of these companies are willing to work with the med services, like the case of Uganda, we are already having some corporate, I mean, corporate responsibility projects with the telecom companies, and the, now we are also working with plantations because they have a very big interest uh, in understanding the climate, uh, because their business is more or less um, rotating around climate. So that is in fact already happening. We have the sugar corporation, then we also have the palm oil uh, uh, plantations. Um, on the uh, Lake Victoria Islands, uh, which are also really partnering very well with us. I think they have a network of around seven uh, automatic stations, and the, we are really working to bring all this data into our service, and we give them products which can be helpful to what they do on a day to day basis. And then maybe the other area, also the tea plantation, which we are also working very closely with. Uh, we are helping them in establishing the station. Sometimes when they are going to purchase their station, we give them the specification, and we know that uh, this specification can fit into the system which we already have as a, a national service. Uh, thank you. I thought that would be my take so far. Thank you very much. That's a humor thing, but there's nothing wrong with WMO standards either. I mean, it's not that we're against them. <laughs> we like them very much as long as they work. If they are an impediment for people to access data to survive, then we don't like them anymore. But that's the only case. But if they would work perfectly all over the place, that would be ideal. Uh, anyway, I would like to ask the man and George, who was asked for, for a specific uh, answer. But, but you know, everybody, everybody will. Yeah, yeah, everybody will, will react. And then we'll go back to the, to the comments. Uh, thank you, Bonnie. Uh, Pascal, your question was on the uh, training and development, what, how it's been catered for the LTA. Yes. So it's um, one of the lots that's been allocated for, it's like a shopping shopping list. You will be able to choose uh, aspects of it, and one of the aspects is training and development. 
and it includes uh, forecaster training, observer training, and technical training for installation and maintenance of, uh, of equipment as well. So they've all provided the training plans, and they've provided um, um, uh, scenario development so that it's all about capacity building within uh, the local country, so you don't have to rely on the equipment manufacturers for support. They, they also, we also put in different levels of support. So first level support would be at the country level, and then if the country cannot solve the problem, then they escalate it to the equipment manufacturer. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to talk about the WMO uh, standards. Uh, as far as we know, in, uh, the stations, the synoptic station by countries are declared at WMO. And even if you have a new station, which are, in, which are all the standards, are lost, are long, are the station are not declared over there. You will not even have your data in the GTS. The data will not go through because everything has been defined before. So in this uh, project, they don't say they, they should abandon the, the synoptic station. No. If the synoptic station has all the necessary uh, power and transmission need and so on, you, they can stand, they can just put the station there. But the point is that we just want to put, to install the weather station where it will be easily used and right now. And you talk about the historic data. We need it for even for climate change and all this. We don't say they should, they cannot close down the subject station. The subject station will still be there. But we need to some to install the station not to be blocked by something. Just to install the station. If the subject station is okay, they put it there. If not, they put the station where we can easily use it. I think that is really what we, we should understand in this project. Thank you. The accuracy and, and tolerance was according to the WMO standards as well. Um, so the equipment themselves, as far as accuracy and tolerance go, meet those requirements, those standards? In large part. In large part, yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's some issues on, I think it was on the, the, pyranometer. the pyranometers, but for the basic stuff, it will definitely meet those requirements. I think the issue will come down to placement of, of the uh, I think I want to just echo what uh, Alan led off with. It, at least from my understanding of this project, of which we're all involved in, it is not a goal of this, it is not a goal of this project to rehabilitate existing stations per se. My colleague uh, Gamini over here is correct. If those sites that have existing stations on will meet and help attain the objectives of this project, fine. But if they won't, then we need to look elsewhere. And Alan, I think, asked the right question. If we invest in rehabilitating existing stations that, for whatever reason, are no longer operational, what exactly is going to be different after we've done that? I think that's a question that has to be addressed. When I joined this project, I was not asked to design a synoptic station that would be operational over a decade, for example. That is a very different engineering problem than what we set out to do in this project, which is to provide early warning services and climate information. Those, that's a different type of, of challenge. Could we design a station, a synoptic scale station for parts of Africa that would survive? The answer to that question is yes. But it would be much more expensive than what we can afford today. I also think that it is not an easy time to be in a National Meteorological Service anywhere in the world. The pressures for credible information are becoming very strong. I'm not sure that you have quite felt it here in Africa yet, but you will. And I think it is exactly that reason 
that we're seeing these novel experiments. And those of you who went to the Philippines and ultimately report some more on that, uh, saw a very novel experiment. I'm not particularly advocating the approach that's been taken there, but it's certainly one that fits the Philippines and is meeting the needs of the Filipino people far more than the government of the Philippines could do, which is what motivated the businessmen to do what they have done to begin with. A big thing that comes out of all this is this idea of credibility. And if we do not provide credible services to local folks, then I, I think we're all going to be in trouble. So I think we, you need to think carefully about Alan's question here. If we just rehabilitate equipment, if we go out and beef up our airfield operations, at the end of the day, what's really going to be different? And there actually are other sources of funds to do some of these things as well, not just this project. Thank you. Uh, in the, it was very much in the spirit we had hoped, I think, Bonnie. Um, a few thoughts in response to your comments. Um, first, Pascal, <laughs> my friend Pascal. Um, your point on index insurance Needing historical data is a fair one. However, it also illustrates exactly the point about do you start with what is your objective? I would say you should be trying to develop a product where the farmers are, whether you have the historical data or not. The, the project should be driven by the need, which is the small farmers, or in vulnerable areas. And if you don't have historical data, I agree. That's going to be a challenge for index insurance. But let me tell you, I've talked with a number of insurance companies, and they're, as Khalid's comment reflects, they're very involved in a number of these search for refining data sets and finding solutions that can make these things work. So the sovereign risk insurance product is one type of solution that is in place. I wasn't aware to what extent Uganda is a participant in the Africa risk capacity, but that's one type of answer that is in, and has been developed in part in partnership with insurance companies. So I would say I don't understand why you would be driven by sites that have historical data unless it's also clear that those are areas <laughs> where you have vulnerable farmers. And you should look for solutions to help vulnerable farmers, with or without historical data. Is that, I think you'll agree that's fair, Pascal. Um, the other point was, I think Zambia was the reference to the World Bank project. First, I worked in the World Bank. <laughs> so I have to be honest and say that I think sometimes we were part of the problem. Sometimes, the World Bank can be part of the problem. I tried to get this project, totally honest, I tried to get this project, I offered this project idea to the World Bank, as well as to UNDP. The World Bank wasn't interested. And the World Bank in the Hydromet Services area, as Bonnie said, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> I would love to be told I'm wrong, because some of these were people I worked with. They had a very strong predilection to do things in very conventional ways. However, the real answer to your comment, in my view, is that there will be instances in which attempting to respond to needs will not address all the business opportunities. However, if you approach a business plan with the knowledge that solar energy development, which I take it was the issue in Zambia, is going to require Insulation, better insulation data, then I think it's hard for me to believe that international agencies or companies are going to find it more efficient to figure that out for themselves as opposed to working to enhance your long-term capacity. That, that just doesn't make sense. That doesn't mean they won't do it because they may just find, they may, especially if your agency doesn't have credibility, 
They might, they might just decide, I've been in some of these meetings. They'll say, do we want to spend three years enhancing the capacity of the Met Agency? Or do we want to just go pay for a consultant study and get that data in you know, 18 months? So I, I think that there are, that's a very good example uh, where a more affirmative business plan approach in which you identify solar insulation as an important opportunity and energy issue for Zambia becomes part of your business plan and then you begin to ask the question of the technical experts, how can we begin to add that into our technical capacity? So it isn't an issue for every country. So it wouldn't make sense to start by having solar insulation as an essential element in every business plan. Am I, mis am I right? I'm, yep. I'm always nervous not being a meteorologist. So, but I, I think you get, get my point. Um, and then I was also very pleased, Khalid, by your reference to some of the examples you gave of companies who are, in fact, contributing to the basic infrastructure goal. So here's an interesting conclusion I would draw from that. So on the one hand, as my colleagues have said, we're, we are not the project that is setting out to provide you with 240 stations. You know that. So in that sense, the total number of systems we are directly financing is a small solution to that total need. However, you gave what I think is a great example of how beginning to approach this in a more outreach way may, even in the short term, produce as many or more systems as we're funding. So you pointed to, what was it, one instance in which you're getting how many stations? Seven. Seven. I, I did meet with the sugar group. I met with one of the larger sugar groups. I have on my list coffee. Uh, so we're on the same page on this, Khalid, but I guess I'm drawing a slightly different conclusion. Because what I'm saying is the sequence here isn't, well, you have to get that basic infrastructure and figure out that first. I think, in fact, operating with more outreach, more business engagement, more focus on why you need this broader participation may, in the, even in the short term, get you more stations than we're paying for. That would be my fact, that the combined response from the broader business community you have, and there are some others we didn't get into, right, in terms of insurance and banking and, um, I, I would hope, and again, it's my point about there's a, there's a synergy between lower cost, making it, making, making it easier for business to participate, right? So if you're asking them, if you're saying each system, you need them to invest $40,000, that's going to be a lot, <laughs> it's going to be a lot harder to get 10 systems out of even a fairly large business than if you can say we're talking about Maybe five, six thousand dollars a system. So, okay. Thank you, Alan. Uh, even though we're getting into lunchtime, I would suggest to you, if you agree, to keep the next questions and discuss them because we have a momentum. I, I wouldn't like to stop it. If you agree, so we can take you know 10, 10, 15 minutes, and then we can you know delay the beginning of a few minutes later on, um, not to not to break you know the the dialogue. And also, I, I would like to ask um, uh, our other experts, Joost, Mark, uh, Anthony, everybody in this room, if, if you have comments, you know, pitch in. Don't, don't wait for a formal invitation. Thank you. Thank you, and I thank all the presenters. I did a good job of listening to all of them. But one key thing that comes up as a big challenge to partnering with the private sector is how we package ourselves. To me, I look at it as a challenge. John Snow has 
wrote it up clearly that we need credible information, but also how do we package the information to the users? Um, maybe Greg can give us more hints on how to improve on that. And then also borrowing from the brief experience we've had from the Philippines team about the low cost uh, automatic weather stations. How possible is it to integrate uh, this into the, the LTA? Because I can look at ourselves procuring over 160 automatic weather stations if we are to get the same, at, uh, I mean, if we are to get the automatic uh, weather stations at the same cost. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've listened to my colleagues from the Med Service and uh, what I want you to understand is um, as, as a med community we came from far. If you look at uh, the service required by med service in the 1960s, it's different from what is happening now. So because of that uh, no need, so, so, so supply and demand. Like, for example, in the 60s, we are very much involved in aviation industry. There was nothing like cost recovery. Everything has been provided by government. But later, when the demand from aviation industry come high, then that's when cost recovery came in. So at least, if you cannot meet, if you cannot sustain um, uh, your service by your government, you can use that the um, they are covering to, to, to provide the services. So, um, as the concern is by Grand Camini, whether med service, those who are claiming, or those who want to be an agency, whether they'll be able to have uh, resources. Based on our own, our own circumstances, what uh, we did now, we will still be receiving money from government, but we have a MOU with the Aviation Authority, and which we intend to extend it to Marine Authority also, so that they will be paying for whatever service that we are providing. Now we are providing that service according to the letter of agreement, though we are not collecting any, 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 any fee. But um, there are so many things associated with that, because our current act doesn't allow us to collect revenue. Uh, revenue. So, with the hope of uh, becoming an agency, you know, at least you revise that uh, act, and that would give us power to, to um, collect revenue. It was in this line that uh, we mentioned that we need to rehabilitate some of our observation network. It was as mentioned by one of my colleagues, that we have historical data from those stations. And uh, in order to be able to use that data for long-term prediction, we need continuation. If there is a break, sometimes you, you will have a... Uh, if there is a break in that, <coughs> if there is a break then there is, uh, then the information will, will be distorted. For that information that needs to be generated, as I said, WMA came from a long way up to now, and they even encourage members to, come to, to, to be quality, to have a quality management system. And one of the components of quality management system is you need to listen to your user. You, need, no, you know we are not going good in going out, selling our product, but the quality management system now is forcing us to go. You, know, you go and meet your, the user, decide on the type of information that we, he wants, how he wants it, then based on that, you can now say this will be the cost as we see with that. You agree on that. So many, many email services are now implementing that. Though for, for our Africa region, is the rate of implementing the QMS is very, very slow because at the moment it's about 58% or so. Mm -hmm. African email services are implementing that. But that will actually would, um, help us in starting from monitoring, providing services or product or services. So you need to sit down and discuss with your user what he wants in what format. 
and uh, so the other concern raised by Bonnie. You know, that's why you know, assess, assess it, the, the demand from from demand from community by uh, for for mess services is is increasing. So as such, that's why WMR came with this global framework of climate services, and they encourage members to come up with a national framework whereby you involve depending on your priority needs. For the global global framework, there is only four priorities, which is disaster, health, agriculture, and uh, water resources. But depending on the national circumstances, you cannot come up with extra priority areas. And uh, the basic basic thing is that you will involve all those sectors in whatever you are doing, so that they will they will be able to understand your limitation, and that they can come in like the support that the project is uh, so providing to this level member country. Because uh, some of the sectors might have uh, more resources than med service. And uh, if they realize that they need the service from med service, and that because of uh, lack of resources, they could not um, provide that services, they can come in. For, uh, um, That's what, I, that's what I have. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I have a few comments to make as well following the intervention of Bonnie, uh, which is about um, meeting the need of the end user. Um, as we are talking about a project to develop resilience of these uh, vulnerable communities, uh, it is it not time now to to reflect on what we have done so far and to see if uh, there is a need to address the implementation aspect of uh, different activities um, as we want to respond clearly to uh, the end user i know that uh, uh, the issue might be associated to the design of the project because usually when we design, we do not ask the end user what he wants. But usually we have that top bottom approach. Uh, then we said we have a project for you. Then we, uh, we have a service to provide. Then my, my, my reflection is, my thinking is to see if as we are entering the second year of implementation, based on the challenges in the ground, if we cannot uh, look at it again in terms of, maybe it's too early to speak about impact, but in terms of um, involvement of stakeholders, of end users, if there are things we need to address or there are things we really need to uh, to change the way of implementing, to allow us to have a real impact at the end of the project, to, to avoid what we used to hear, another project again, another papers, other studies, and that's it. Uh, it was a UNDP project. And, but to see how they can really um, appropriate with a, 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 real, uh, a real impact. Um, we, you've been talking about the, 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 the bottom-up approach. What, what can we do uh, to permit us to have that real uh, implication and participation of the end user uh, in the project? One of the colleagues talked about the theory of change. Um, it is it not time as well to, to ask maybe each country uh, to go back and have a look at the project logical framework and to have a very clear vision again about which change, because each country is quite specific, and try to see which uh, theory of change, which change each country is expecting to have at the end uh, of the project. 
maybe that will be one of the the exercise uh, each country will go with it to to help to help every country team to refresh their mind about the project and to know exactly where where we are and where we are going um, just to avoid the the loss of vision to say a uh, few exchange I have with few colleagues think we are expecting the LTA of the regional office or the regional team that's what we are waiting to move on it's like uh, uh, activities were only focused on that LTA and then people really start thinking again what's next then just to see if it's not already time to, to reflect on the specific case of each country to know exactly where we are to have a clear vision which associate with what the other colleague said about the theory of change for each specific country based on uh, the, the, the logical framework and that will help us to identify uh, the other issues and to identify exactly what the end user will have at uh, the end of the project. Thank you very much. Just to, say, to share what the NMA director in Ethiopia has said about this project. The, the meteorological service in Ethiopia has started in 1980. If you take only automatic weather station, since 1980, the agency has managed to procure 70 automatic weather station. In 20 after in 27 years, after 27 years, only in one year time, they manage to get 40 automatic weather station. So he said it. You pave the way for transformation of climate information and an early warning system in this country with only one year by procuring for us 40 automatic weather station. So in my view, this project is only halfway, only two years. And it's very premature to talk about whether this project has brought transformational change or not. But in our opinion, it has paved the way for immense transformational change with regard to climate information and warning this project. I'm sorry, before giving it to Mark, I have to tell you something. I, I, I really a person who is not very keen in liking um, slang. Uh, I mean, I, I really cannot stand <laughs> the term transformational change. Sorry. I know the Jeff loves it and puts it everywhere. I just can't stand it. I just want to, I'm a person who likes common sense, okay? When things don't work, they have to change. That's the change we're looking for. People are dying, the data we're providing are not sufficient, well, something has to be changed. Forget about the, the slogan, please. I'm not coming here to bring some, you know, blah, blah, blah to your table. I'm really trying to, to do something together that makes sense. So change for, to me means only that. Um, it, we're really, I, I, I wouldn't like really this debate would become on, on, you know, whatever the Jeff or UNDP or whatever decides is the buzzword for the year because believe me, that's not my style. So the change is due to the fact that it's not, something is not working. Can we, can we put our brains and our money together to make it work better for the good of these, of these people? That, that's very simple. And uh, someone mentioned the World Bank. Uh, there is tons of literature about World Bank failure in their investments in climate information in Africa. Independent evaluation, lots of, lots of literature, literature that says that. So that's why we're, we were thinking about together, let's find the change because what hasn't worked, we don't want to duplicate or replicate because it doesn't help anybody. Mark, go ahead. Um, no, that's, I mean, you've said uh, some of the things that I wanted to say anyway. Sorry. But uh, I think for me, I'm, I'm, I'm sat here and, I, and I, I'm stunned by the richness of the conversation. I think we've gone a long way since when we first started. And this conversation is, is amazing, I think. I think it's actually really good for all of us because I don't, you know, I don't think we would have had it a long time ago. I just want to pick up on a couple of things. I mean, we've talked about end users. I think that's really important. And what John said about um, 
designing backwards from the end user and the, um, and the requirements for information of particular end users. We have to we have to bear that in mind, and we have to show that. I think. Um, but on this on this ideas of you know synoptic stations versus non-synoptic stations, there's no right or wrong answer here. Um, you know if we, we take the point, you know, if you want a synoptic station, if you want to have a long time series of climate data um, and you need to show that, then yes, sure, you know, put in synoptic stations, but don't let that be your driving force. Don't let that be your only consideration. Um, having less accurate but more spatially distributed um, measurements are arguably more effective at certainly providing early warning, early warnings. So let's try and move towards that. Um, we can still do the synoptic stuff as well. The budgets are big enough. But let's not just just do that. Let's do the new stuff as well. Let's put in the low cost stations. And I think you know we'll we'll improve and we'll we'll work out what, what works best in the long term. And in all these projects, not just these projects, but other UNDP projects around the world, the critical thing is operations and maintenance. And We've kind of skirted around this issue a little bit as well, but you know, lower cost stations, less maintenance. At least if you're going to just replace a station, it can ha easily happen. Um, also, you know, do you have the staff to, to to look after these stations as well? So, building the human resources, getting the governments to put in more budgets, increase your budgets for met, uh, met services. It's critical. Otherwise, we're not going anywhere. We have to do that, and, and really to do that, we have to start providing the services that are talked about um, and bring in those, those kind of partnerships that uh, Alan talked about as well, um, to bring in the actual the cash to keep these systems flowing. So I just wanted to, but, but bottom line is, I think this, this, everyone has made excellent points here. No one has said anything that I would disagree with, and it's just a question of finding that balance out. Thank you so much, Mark. Yes, my only disappointment is we didn't disagree enough. But uh, I think this group, you know, the, the intelligence, the knowledge, the expertise, the commitment of this group is so amazing. Don't be afraid to be ambitious. You can do anything. You can help your people more. You can do more. You can do a lot, but you can do even more. Just, just, just don't be afraid. Remember when we set up the in 2001 the LDC fund? People thought there would be peanuts, would be $300,000 a piece to do some little NAPAs. And now, and now uh, LDCs could act at $30 million a piece. I mean, of course, it's not enough, but it was very different from what was perceived at the beginning. So why not thinking bigger? We can do it. I hope. Thank you. Let's go eat. <laughs>